Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege and honor to have been invited to participate in this uh, forum arranged by the Future of Human Rights Forum. I congratulate the organizers on this very timely initiative because unfortunately human rights and particularly the violations thereof continuously present on the agenda of mankind and in need of discussion, debates and publicity in order to focus the attention on the problems. This is not an ordinary celebration of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, in the sense that the Future of Human Rights Forum uh, is aimed at uh, breaking new ground. If you look around the planet, I've served for the last 13 years in several duty stations around the world, and I can tell you that what I saw on the ground we had uh, very little resemblance to what I read in the literature. Durant les 65 ans qui se sont écoulés depuis la Déclaration universelle, des changements considérables ont vu le jour qu'ils contiennent ne pas sous-estimer. Si cette évolution est loin d'être aussi linéaire que pourrait le laisser penser une présentation aussi sommaire, constitue indéniablement une reconnaissance croissante de l'importance des droits de l'homme dans le système international, la vraie question que nous devons nous poser est celle de l'efficacité de ce système vu de l'homme du point de vue de celles et de ceux dont il est censé protéger les droits, c'est-à-dire les victimes et les personnes vulnérables. Dès lors, il s'agit, moins lors de ces journées, de dresser un catalogue de mesures que de repenser comment demain le système des droits de l'homme dans son ensemble, normatif, judiciaire et institutionnel, pourra répondre aux problèmes que nous identifions. Votre expérience, vos idées et vos suggestions the current human rights protection system needs to be strengthened. I would like to invite participants on the forum, most of whom they were key actors in its construction in the 70s, to embark into a reflection on the context and ways the system was developed before the process started being slowed down and even eroded as one would turn at the turn of the century under the pretext of the fight against terrorism leading to a clear shift from the insight of human rights experts and NGOs towards the imposition of state logics. I guess that this may provide us with the right perspective to identify appropriate solutions to the shortcomings which may be identified currently. It's an expansion, an expansion of how we govern our world, an expansion of our understanding. It's based on the premise of the interconnectedness of life. Ecocide is, I, what I'm proposing is to create an international law. Essentially, it's the implementation mechanism to, to create governance of the human right to life. The law of ecocide itself actually has a history uh, this is an idea that was first mooted back in 1972 at the Stockholm Conference. In fact, it was opened with a call for a law of ecocide. The amazing thing is, is that it's clearly an idea of its time. 54 member states last year, nations of, of the United Nations, came forward in one way or another asking for legal advice on this. All of you, I'm sure, would be open to this and willing to go ahead with it, knowing that it's going to help the planet and the human rights, mm. that it's everybody's, in a way, responsibility to make this go forward. Mm, and I'm a great believer in this. Rights is very nice, but responsibilities are very important as well. Humans, of course, very important to protect humans from the negative environmental impacts. It's very important to empower humans to fight for the environment on the one hand, we have all the efforts made at, that by people who want to protect humans, particularly the vulnerable people. On the other hand, there is a different school of thought that focuses primarily on procedural rights. Is the right to food attainable if the provisioning function of the ecosystems is lost? Of course it's not. Think of the right to water. Water comes from the function of, of ecosystems. There's no other way to maintain the cycle of water 
that gives us the water that we use every day. Is the world understanding these links sufficiently? Can we think of going back to some of the results of this scientific assessment of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment to reframe the environmental agenda, the environmental rights agenda today and make it more powerful and more appealing to those who worry about the rights to development. In fact, from a very rigorous legal perspective, you could build an argument, a more ecocentric argument, by using an adjective which is not too closely connected to human health. If we say a human right to a decent environment, or to a satisfactory environment, or to a healthy environment, this is not legally the same thing. Why? Because depending on the adjective that you choose, the connection between the degradation of the environment and the impact on the person will be different. What we need now is to make sure that any major degradation of the environment, irrespective of the direct serious effects on a specific human right are banned by human rights treaties. Now, if you use the term healthy environment, the connection between degradation and harm on personality is much more difficult to establish than if you use other terms like satisfactory environment. For 40 something years, the relationship between human rights and the environment has been looked at synergistic. Now, what about conflicts? No one, no one is talking about conflicts in the international legal community. And yet, there are indeed conflicts. The first environmental case of the new African, no longer precisely new, but uh, insufficiently used, I would say, African Court on Human and People's Rights, not the Commission, the Court, the case brought by the Commission against Kenya uh, to protect the Ojiek community that is being evicted from the Mao forest because of some conservation, at least that's how Kenya is presenting those policies, some conservation policies clearly show again that there may be uh, conflicts. which I have the honor to moderate, will elucidate new international structures and initiatives to shape the future world order, including an enhanced consciousness about responsibilities and duties. Bottom line, therefore, is we all endorse democracy. We all believe in democracy. But what is democracy? It is consultation, it is participation, and we have a great problem of a disconnect between power and people. And we have dysfunctional uh, parliaments in many democratic countries. It's the ability to go in and get an order and stop some atrocious thing from happening before it happens. It's the ability to go in and get an order to stop some destruction of the environment before it happens. We do not exist in international law, basically. Because the main subjects of international law, those who create this law, are the states. A parliamentary assembly at the United Nations, what would it be about, really, in a nutshell? It would be about to give the world's citizens a voice in the international system. Every right must be accompanied by a remedy. Um, now, many will argue that in international human rights treaties, we the remedy is provided at the domestic level by the individual states, and you don't need an inter international court to, to have um, a remedy. Um, but if, if the rights are guaranteed internationally, then why shouldn't the remedies be uh, guaranteed internationally as well? International criminal court, the establishment of an office of the high commissioner, and for a world court on human rights. Two of those have now been achieved 
this is the last big outstanding piece, I think, of the UN architecture um, that, that hasn't been achieved. Dialogue is about learning together. It is learning to listen carefully to each other's thinking in order to understand, not necessarily to agree. It is learning to speak clearly and articulate our ideas and values, and yet be mindful of the multiple ways in which others may translate our meaning and values into their own framework of understanding. Dialogue is an opportunity to learn how to read carefully and develop an appetite for diverse texts from many cultures and to increase our global literacy. I think Ibor could be one of those common texts. Putting Ibor on the table provides something upon which we can focus together a common text to share and to explore. We're not saying we have the answers, like what Alfred was saying. We're not saying we have the answer. What we're saying is please participate with us in thinking through what would be in an International Bill of Rights. Um, early on, you mentioned that a lot of uh, human rights defenders will end up getting framed uh, for crimes that they didn't commit. How exactly can that be prevented? Never accept an envelope from the policeman because you, know, you accept the envelope and the next day or an hour later you're arrested. Uh, don't uh, uh, offer a drink and then your fingerprints are on the glass. So these are ways, these are small tricks that the police are doing and if you're aware of it, you, you could at least try and stop it. No, the only thing is that human rights defenders are obviously by far the most important element. Uh, it's not to play down any of you in the audience, any of my friends who worked in the UN or the national human rights commissions and councils, all this big industry of human rights institutions is nothing if there are no human rights defenders. Human rights defenders can be exploited more not only we need to protect them, we need to exploit them in the sense of making them role models to inspire others. Nelson Mandela. He's not just a man and a great human rights defender. He was a legend in his lifetime. He shone the beacon of human rights magnificently, not only for South Africa, but for the whole world. And he too, showed that what was thought impossible at one time was achievable and possible. So the International Bill of Rights, the International Parliament, and the International Court of Human Rights are all possible. Every single person in the world, and there are a vast number of people, the majority of people out there, they have a very vague notion of human rights, especially when it touches them, when it violates their rights, but they don't know where to go or how to remedy those violations. There's a wonderful regime. We have all the international treaties, laws, conventions, mechanism, processes, and procedures for human rights, to address human rights. And yet, when there was a critical need in all of these areas, we were very slow to react. We always acted after the fact. This morning we spoke about individuals, indigenous groups, whose habitat and livelihood is being threatened. They are being ousted. Their fundamental basic rights are being infringed. And yet we seem to be incapable of dealing with the huge forces that threaten those rights. The world has glorified the pursuit of wealth. We admire people who make huge amounts of wealth and we support, the global system supports international corporations, the extractive industries who make wealth, private wealth, for private companies, for private individuals. Nowadays, human rights and democratic development have three main enemies, namely oil and gas, geopolitics, and war on terror. The war on terror in this context includes a wide range of efforts from rooting out extremism and radical thoughts to imposing stability that many governments tend to interpret in the way they see fit. Oil and gas clearly have got an upper hand in domestic politics. 
majority of countries and the country where I'm from, Kazakhstan, with oil and gas driving economy, tend to cultivate dictatorships, authoritarian and vastly corrupt regimes that use national resources to make the rich richer and to keep the rest under control. Under the pretext of combating terrorism, extremism, and radicalism, many countries, including those who never faced any clear threat, have opted to increase the repression of dissent and curtail civil rights and freedoms. Human rights conventions are clearly taking a back seat to other international treaties. Failure to observe human rights commitments is almost a new norm that does not entail any legal, political, or moral consequences. International debates on human rights almost never go beyond political correctness. We need to keep saying that black is black, white is white, that two plus two equals four, that either you have freedom or you don't, and there is not middle ground. This dialogue is to engage you, the participants, to get your perspectives on what would be actionable ideas for strengthening enforcement of human rights. It is also an opportunity for the participants, for you, to share your stories and what has been successful and what questions you still have on how to make human rights accessible to all. was to go against the DRC government. So far, there are only 880 mountain gorillas. According to the African Wildlife Foundation, 58 have been killed. And the M23 fund their operation through mining and especially through gold. Every time the rebels raid villages to recruit soldiers, child soldiers, they would normally rape. This violates Article 5, which reads, no one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. Like men and teenagers have been kidnapped from the villages and have been forced into joining the M23 rebels and fighting, um, uh, fighting the government. Um, and we thought that this violates Article 23, which is everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and fa favorable conditions of work, and to protection against uh, unemployment. A 60 two-year-old man was re reportedly shot dead because he refused to hand his sons over to the rebels. And um, according to a UN report, four in 10 ch children between ages of 10 to 14 are involved in the M23 rebellion. We need to state loud and clear that violence is unacceptable, violence is immoral, violence is absurd, and violence is abnormal, and that the norm is not violence, but the norm is peace. We are living in a culture of violence where violence is considered the norm. And how do we move out of a culture of violence and replace it by something so much more positive? Children's violent video games are normal. Yes, of course, six-year-olds tend to see 18-year-old violent video games because parents don't see any reason not to show it uh, because violence is normal in the mentality of so many people and that there are norms for l less than th uh, three-year-olds and less than 12-year-olds and less than 16-year-olds and less than 18-year-olds and in all these cases it was just regulating the amount of violence that one can show in the video that the children can play with. How many people can they kill? How many people they can torture? How many people can they maim? This is what the games are about. We're not even realizing that this is completely against the whole education system that is being put place in Switzerland and the rest of the, rest of the world. So I would like to conclude and say uh, values is one point, skills are another point, and uh, creating the same awareness to create a culture of peace that is shared is uh, really our way to go forward. Because sometimes I think when we think about future ideas for human rights, we should not forget there are some basics. And those are important, like the absolute prohibition of torture, cruel and human degrading treatment, which goes to the very core of what human rights are. Every state that practices slavery is an outcast in the international community. We have an absolute prohibition of torture that is uncontested. 
but torture is practiced almost around the world. And none of these states, or very few of these states, are treated as a sort of outcast in the international community. One of the repercussions of 9-11, and I will say something in the very end to this, is that we have the emergence of intelligence actors operating also in international cooperation with other intelligence services, and there's zero accountability over these actors. So should these actors have these powers in the first place? And there's the question of legal accountability in terms of the right to remedy and reparation for victims of torture and other serious human rights violations. And I think we have to have much more emphasis on this last element, because we do know that prevention will not work if we never ensure that in the history of, a, of the lifetime of a country, there is at least once an event of accountability. Another core, I think, is where we probably failed over the last years is to bring in the public. Too often, I think, as human rights lawyers, and I'm a human rights lawyer, we treat it as a technical issue. One of the specialists of lawyers, uh, state officials, functionaries. But if we don't have public support on the cause against torture, I think we will not achieve what we want to achieve. Cette communication qu'il faut établir est une autre voie complémentaire aux autres idées qui ont été développées. Aujourd'hui, moi, quand j'en discute, aussi bien avec les protagonistes qu'avec les gouvernements ou les autres acteurs, je comprends que le temps de la guerre est terminé. Il faut un dialogue. Le problème, c'est quel dialogue avec qui et qui peut organiser son dialogue avec l'autorité. The development process cannot be achieved without, without having access to safe drinking water and safe sanitation. This is the basic human rights. All we collected during this day, clearly so much more to do. We have uh, put on the screen uh, the results of the uh, discussions that you had. This is ex uh, what you propose. This is what you think. I believe this is a very important, very rich reflection on various substantive initiatives that need to be focused upon, among them the Parliamentary Assembly, the International Bill, the Ecocide issue, the Environment issue, the World Court, uh, and then on the institutional side, uh, uh, brilliant interventions on uh, the need to address uh, core human rights issues that still exist. One could see how wide the spectrum is when it comes to human rights. Water, Great Lakes in Africa, torture, mediation, and what have you, transnationals, and so on and so forth. I say like they do in Geneva, un grand merci. Monsieur Dame. <laughs>